Welcome everyone to another episode of Single Mole Strategy. This is episode 37 and this is an interview episode. I have Frederick Wallen from Naval Warfare Simulations and we're here to talk about his newest game, which is Rule the Waves 2. And I have two co-hosts, a returning guest, which is Eric Tortuga. And <laughs> I have Matt, the historical gamer with me. Welcome everybody, welcome to the show. Great to be here as always. It's good to be here. Yep. Thanks for having me back. I'm a little surprised, but uh, well, if you guys want to do that damage yourself, that's fine. <laughs> I tried to fire you, but uh, but John wouldn't let me. <laughs> didn't, didn't work, huh? It's such a place in my heart. <laughs> I pay him a lot of money to keep me on. <laughs> hey, I didn't put them my taxes, so you can't say that publicly. <laughs> hmm. uh, yeah, of course not. I didn't mean that at all. <laughs> All right, so let's just jump right into the interview because we have a multitude of questions, and I'm very eager to pick Frederick's brain on a lot of the uh, things that went on with uh, Rule the Waves. And we're going to kind of just jump around, so I'm going to ask a couple questions, Eric Tortuga is going to ask a couple questions, and then Matt's going to jump in every so often to ask a couple questions. So you're going to be hearing from all of us during this interview. I guess I will get us started. First, I wanted to ask you, before we even dive into Rule the Waves 2, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is, when you grew up, what were your favorite strategy games that most influenced you? One of my first war games was Avalon Hills Jutland, uh, actually, Mm -hmm. and uh, that was a great game for its time. I played it to death, and I modified it. I made my own ship. so I played that a lot, and of course that was uh, an inspiration for Rule of Ways. That was many years ago. Then of course I played uh, other games in the same naval war games, like Flat Top. And, uh, so those are board games. I was also inspired, of course, by by some computer games. Uh, Fighting Steel, for example, is one. Yeah, Jetlin was a great game. I have you guys played Jetlin growing up, Matt? And- no, I know. I never did. I did not. I really don't have any, you know, until computer gaming, until I started playing like Rule the Waves, um, Great Naval Battles of the North Atlantic, and a few others. I didn't really have any sort of board gaming uh, history with naval war games. Uh, but I did do some forum, forum-based It was kind of interesting. I, I noticed a common trend there, Frederick. I'm going to go a little off script, uh, that you were... Obviously, you mentioned a bunch of of naval games. Was that sort of your primary interest in gaming when when you were first gaming? And and was there sort of an impetus for that? Or was it just sort of, uh, you know, a subset of the games you played? Uh, It's more of a subset. Uh, I I always loved games. I uh, started to modify board games when I was a kid. Not war games, but regular board games. I remember doing my own maps and modifications to various board games. So... I've always loved games, and I was always interested in military history. So uh, I've played a lot of different war games of of all kinds. One quick question, just curious. How did you end up connecting with the folks at NWS? That's a good question, yeah. It was a long time ago when I did this uh, add-on for Fighting Steel. Uh, I did a campaign add-on that connected the battles in, in Fighting Steel. So that's something I just did for, for fun. And then I, I started uh, speaking to Chris and William on, at uh, Naval Warfare Simulations, and they they wanted to publish this. And yeah, it all went from that. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Now, Jutland, did Jutland kind of inspire you to develop the Rule the Waves uh, series that you started? Not not only Jutland, of course, there was a lot of inspiration. Another inspiration was Master of Orion, uh, actually. I played that a lot. And uh, the, the space game, the 4X game, when you, where you can design your own spaceships, uh, that was an inspiration. I, I, was, I started to think that it should be possible to do this for, for real ships uh, on Earth. Oh, I was going to say, have you ever heard of... Uh, there's basically a game which <laughs> Rule of Waves is often compared to the only thing which has such depth in ship design, and it's a game called Aurora 4X. Have you heard of that, or have you played that? Uh, I know about it, and I've heard about uh, heard of it, but I haven't played it myself. It's a sad thing when you're uh, when you're a game designer, you don't have time to so much time as you'd want to play other games. Yeah, I bet. Uh, Frederick, what was so you mentioned that you were 
modifying board games and other things like that. So clearly you've always sort of had a creative streak. But what was your first computer game that you kind of put together on your own? What inspired it? I've uh, made, I've done several computer games, various projects, but uh, Rule the Waves is my first uh, published game. Now, I'm kind of new to Rule the Waves. I kind of just started with Rule the Waves 2, so I know you guys have all played in uh, Rule the Waves 1. The one thing I wanted to ask you, when did the original come out? That when, when, you did, when did you first release the Rule the Waves 1? Oh, good question. I don't remember the year. It was uh, four years ago or something like that. I'm sorry, I should know this, but <laughs> time flies. <laughs> So were you involved at all in Steam and Iron then? Oh, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yes, of course. Steam and Iron, I did that first. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, when I, Steam and Iron was... Uh, no, the first published game, actually, if I think about it, it's uh, I made a campaign add-on for Fighting Steel. That was called Thunder at Sea. Uh, so that uh, made scenarios for uh, the Fighting Steel game. Uh, but then uh, that was sort of an add-on to an existing game. But my first uh, published game was Steam and Iron. Uh, and already when I started making Steam and Iron, I had the thought that I should someday develop it into something that had a, a ship construction part to it. So some, some things in Steam and Iron were already prepared for doing the, the strategic layer with ship design and construction. So that was Steam and Iron, and that was uh, World War I, uh, naval warfare, mostly uh, in the North Sea, uh, Germany and Britain. Uh, and then there was a campaign uh, add-on for that, so you could play the entire North Sea campaign. And I also added a Baltic campaign with the Germans against the Russians. Now, before we kind of dive a little bit too further into Rule the Waves, I wanted to ask, because there's some... People, there are some gamers out there that probably are not familiar with the game. What is Rule the Wave? So for people that haven't played it yet. Oh, Rule the Waves is uh, a game about ship design and naval warfare. The original Rule the Waves covered the period from 1900 to 1925. So it covers the, the dreadnought building race of the early 20th century. Uh, you are the Grand Admiral of one of the nations you can uh, play germany or britain the us uh, italy france or japan or russia and you uh, make decisions about uh, what ships to build how to design them and you do all that within the framework of a budget uh, and then of course there is all the international uh, uh, relations with the other nations that is handled semi uh, abstractly with the tension bars. So tension will rise depending on your own actions. Uh, in some cases, there are events that you can decide different courses of action that will influence the tension level. And eventually, when tension goes high enough, there will be a war. So the, the player is uh, a grand admiral handling the fleet, but he's not in, in charge of the entire nation and those decisions. So to some extent, the player is also a uh, has to react to other events or the emperor or the prime minister wants to build battleships and things like that. Yeah, I love the event-driven system that you have in this game. That's really cool. It kind of reminds me of like Hearts of Iron and it kind of adds so many more, I would, I would say, dimensions to the game because there's so many kind of paths that you can code down. One other thing I wanted to kind of say thank you on you did, I, don't, I don't think you mentioned it, but the Confederacy is in this game. And when I saw that, I thought that was awesome. And you have the like the Robert E. Lee battleship. I thought that was a pretty nice touch. So I just wanted to put out a, sh a quick shout out for that. Oh, it's uh, it's good. It's appreciated. It was just a, a fun thing to have a what if nation. So that's also one thing. Uh, the, the players can make their own custom nations in the game so there are uh, there is a possibility to create your own custom nations with some work and people have done that there are uh, mods that cover the byzantine empire for example and other nations 
Yeah, I saw there was a mod out there for the Mediterranean specifically, where all the nations involved were the Mediterranean countries. So you had the Ottoman Empire, you had, uh, I think Greece was in the mod as well. So obviously a lot of interest and passion around it. I think the the, the kind of the neat thing uh, that I like about the tension aspect in this game, um, you were talking about how you're the you're the fleet admiral or you're the the secretary of the navy or basically you know you're in charge of the navy so you influence things like tension through how you act but it's not just you right your prime as as you said your prime minister might ask you to do something international tensions international events can occur and so there there's this bigger world that kind of moves around you and you know i'm i'm reading robert massey's dreadnought right now and it's it's very much like you're a character in the book, essentially, where, you know, you're doing your own thing and you have your own agenda, but you by yourself don't control everything. And I think that's an interesting departure, at least for me personally. I always enjoy games that make you feel more like you're a little bit of a cog in, in a bigger machine. And obviously, as the head of the Navy, you're certainly a pretty big cog, but you don't control everything that goes on in the world. And I think that's an interesting design choice because a lot of strategy games out there basically make you essentially God where you control everything. Uh, and sometimes limitation in scope, it can, can pose an interesting challenge. Yes. That that's what I wanted to bring out in the game to, to bring out sort of the spirit of the times with, uh, uh, the various events, the pressure to, to, for the arms race, uh, to build more and bigger ships. And on the same time, we had the social tensions with the rise of various socialist parties and eventually the wars uh, of the First World War ending in, in revolution for many nations. I wanted to to bring out all of that. And I think it, from what you say, I, I, I'm happy to hear that I'm successful in that respect. Yeah, I think one of my favorite events is when you're fighting in a war against another country and you get the event that pops up to basically ask, uh, it's not Lenin specifically, it's it's just a generic revolutionary, but it's basically like, do you want to send a revolutionary into another country to try and destabilize and overthrow them? And you kind of have to make that decision on, well, it might help overthrow the government and win me the, win me the war, but there's also a good chance that, you know, if we unleash Bolshevism, it may come back and topple our own government and we may have a you know a, a 1919 germany fleet mutiny or something yes exactly in in uh, rule the waves 2 i've developed that further so uh, the political situation changes over time so there is uh, uh, basically there are less kaisers and more Führers, and there will be fascist coups and uh, other political events that are more typical of the 30s than the early 20th century in Rule the Waves 2. Well, while we're on that topic, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, so like you mentioned Rule the Waves 1 covered 1900 to 1925. So as you said, sort of the dreadnought era, the big gun era. But in Rule the Waves 2, you extend that out into the 1950s, which I presume adds a lot of different challenges because the world certainly changes a lot between 1900 and 1920 and then 30 and 40 and 50. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach that and how does the game deal with that? Uh, yes, the, the basic uh, political environment is, is uh, that, of course, has to be modified. As I mentioned, the, the political events of the 30s are different. But then the, the biggest challenge is, of course, the changes in naval warfare. With the advent of uh, aircraft, there were no aircraft in, in Rule the Waves 1, but in Rule the Waves 2, there are lots of aircraft. And uh, I thought that would be rather easy. You know, we take Rule the Waves, we add some aircraft, and then we are done. But it turned out, of course, it was uh, a lot more complicated than that. Uh, simulating uh, carrier air operations is a very complicated subject. Uh, it has to simulate the, the readying of aircraft, the spotting, bringing up them up to the flight deck, arranging them, and then taking off. And at that time, other aircraft cannot land or do anything. You have to launch combat air patrol and recon planes. It's a, a very complex subject to simulate, I discovered. 
Now, the you were mentioning Rule the Waves 1 uh, took us to 1925, and then the Rule the Waves 2 took us to 1950. I'm just kind of curious, why specifically did you make Rule the Waves starting with the early 20th century and you're moving into the mid 20th century? Is is that what you're very passionate about, uh, that particular uh, error in naval combat? When I did Rule the Waves, I was more, I wanted to simulate the early 20th century and the dreadnought building race. Uh, and it was based on, on steam and iron, so it was logical to start with the, the early era. Uh, and then you rule the waves too, it's been extended. And that was, of course, it's influenced by rule the waves being a success. And there are uh, lots of fans out there and they have, uh, of course, made lots of suggestions on how to proceed. So it was logical to continue with the, with the later period building on rule the waves one to extend it to 1950. And rule the waves two is actually a standalone game. You don't need rule the waves one to play it. The Rule of Waves 2 covers all the time period from uh, 1900 to about around 1950. Now, number, numerous people may uh, mention that there are mods for this game. Is there a possibility that people can make a mod that kind of pushes naval combat to possibly the Cold War or even the semi-modern period? No, it, the game is, is moddable uh, to add... Uh, other nations or or uh, to change it to different settings as you mentioned with the mediterranean but modding the time period is not really possible because there is a lot of new technology coming after the 50s with missiles guided missiles uh, so uh, it needs completely new game logic for that we may possibly at some future date extend it further or there has also been a user uh, requests to extend the game backwards to start earlier in naval history in the 1880s or something like that. Oh, wow. Now, do you have any interest in the uh, age of sail? Would that be a, a, even a possibility to even go that far back? Might be a possibility, and, and I have an interest in the period, but it's very different. It's, uh, I'm, well... Uh, I played with the uh, with the idea, but uh, naval warfare at that time is very different. It's much more short range. It's more about making tactical maneuvers, raking and boarding, and so uh, it's partly a different thing. And there are also uh, rather good games that cover that period. I do think you know. I I think I'm one of the fans, Frederick, who would like to see a little bit earlier start date than 1900, just personally, because I think. You know, one of the interesting tensions about the 19, the early 1900s, which is my favorite period of naval history, is this idea of technology changing rapidly so that by the time a ship you design actually comes on, uh, you know, into service, in many cases, it's already obsolete. And I think that's really that's a it's a cool element of this period of history. And I think the, the game reflects it, too, because, you know, I know I, we, we haven't gotten quite into all the details yet. But there is an element of you're the head of the Navy, so you're also in charge of research and development. And so you have to decide how much of your naval budget is going to go to researching new technology. And then you have to decide even within that, within different areas of technology, what are the priorities for your Navy, right? Do you want to prioritize developing new guns, you know, 14-inch guns, 15-inch guns, higher quality guns? Do you want to prioritize your... Uh, hull division and subsections and all that type of stuff. You want to prioritize your torpedo development. So there's a whole bunch of different categories that you have to, um, you know, focus on and figure out where your priority lies. What type of navy do you want to build? Which I think is awesome. I just personally <laughs> would like to see it a little bit earlier because I like the idea of really capturing the full pre-dreadnought era. Era because even in that period, there's a lot of change. You know, if you like go from the, the Royal Sovereigns coming online, which I think are generally considered the first of the pre-Dreadnought ships, which are around the 1890s, early 1890s. Um, and then the pre-Dreadnought era is pretty much over by 1905 with the, with the launch of the Dreadnought itself. Um, but I, I, I do think there's room to move forward. I think it, it would probably be very challenging, I imagine, for you to move much beyond that, though, because, you know, if you look... It's interesting, but if you look at, at chip designs between the 1870s and the 1890s, there's like 30 different ideas that ship designers are out there trying to figure out what's going to work. And there weren't really a lot of battles there to figure out what really is the better 
type of shit. So I think if you were to move it forward, definitely something I would support, but I don't know how much further you could move it forward without just a lot of, um, a lot of changes to how combat would take place to your point about, uh, you know, age of sail, especially where the, the way ships fought were totally different. Yes. I thought about bringing it forward, but, uh, exactly as you say, the, the, Technological developments are so fast. The, the progress is even more rapid in that, that period than later. So, uh, and different kinds of armors that totally changed uh, the resistance of armor and new guns. And well, I think it, at the most it might be possible to bring it back to 1890 or something like that because technological progress is already so fast in that period. And also, it's already challenging as it is to uh, rule the waves attempts to, to simulate ship design over 50 years as it is in rule the waves too. And it's, ship design is a very complex subject. And adding then the technological change and research that will change the, the relationships on, on how the formulas work for designing ships, uh, it it aims to make it possible to design the ships that were actually designed historically, but it cannot uh, simulate every ship in that period. I already got some flack for Rule Waves 2 because you apparently it's difficult to build the Yamato. And uh, I might have to, to adjust the calculations there for a, a, a later release, but it's, it's difficult for a game to to cover so complex a subject that ship design during so long time period. One follow up to what you were just talking about, Frederick, you know, obviously ship design is very complex and I'm, I'm sure incredibly difficult to balance, right? What kind of research like did you do to figure out how you were going to, how you were going to set this game up? I mean, did you read a lot of documents about warships of the era or how do you, how do you research about this type of uh, a type of a topic to ensure that you're you're capturing uh, the right types of designs or you know how ships perform in combat or you know what what does that all look like for someone like you as kind of developing this? Do you have people doing the research for you and kind of telling you how to balance things or uh, is that was that all your homework? Or how did that all work? Uh, I basically I read up on the subject of. Uh ship design and naval combat and uh, uh, I try I made the algorithm to create the, the ships of the different eras so it's uh, it's mostly my own research and William has helped some uh, of course with the, the development of uh, some of the aspects of, of the development of the ships but uh, mostly it's our own research it's not like I have a 15 scientists team sitting around doing the calculations for me. <laughs> well, with the ways, the successful like release of Rule the Waves and then Rule the Waves 2, well, maybe by Rule the Waves 3, we'll start getting there. <laughs> yes, maybe. Yeah. That's one of the questions I actually wanted to ask is you started off with um, Steam and Iron, which I, I don't know, I don't have any sales numbers or anything like that, but I'm just guessing based on interest or what I've heard from other people that, you know, it was probably a a successful topic for a very niche game, but I just have to guess that Rule the Waves has completely blown Steam and Iron out of the water in terms of you know public interest or even sales. Um, what do you really attribute to that? Because Steam and Iron is the base for Rule the Waves. It's not different, right? I mean, Rule the Waves is just adding a strategic shell to it. Or what? What do you think? How do you think that Rule the Waves has become so big, whereas uh, Steam and Iron, which is wonderful combat we see in the game is all steam and iron why did that not take off initially yes i wondered about that myself actually and uh, now the combat system is somewhat developed in in rule the waves it's more advanced than steam and iron but as you say it's basically it's the same uh, combat system i really don't know uh, <clears throat> i i suppose that people like playing games that are connected to a long story i think that's part of the success like um, many 4x games where you play a, a, a nation or a, or a, a for a very long time you develop things and you tinker with things and you sort of nurture your empire or your state along in 
in history, whether it's science fiction or Earth-based 4X games. So I think players like to have uh, some context, some story that goes on for a long time, not just single battle, but the, but the connected whole. I, I know Eric and I know Matt, you guys played Rule the Waves 1, and I mentioned earlier that I'm kind of a newcomer. I, I jumped into Rule the Waves 2. So I wanted to ask, what are the differences and improvements that one fan can expect going from Rule the Waves 1 to Rule the Waves 2? What kind of changes were made? Well, the main changes are, uh, of course, that the time time is extended to 1950s and the addition of aircraft. That is the most important change that players will know that you have. Suddenly you have air bases to manage. You must develop your aircraft types. You don't design them in the same way as ships. Uh, it's handled a little more abstractly. So you, you ask for uh, prototypes from your aircraft industry and you will get uh, a couple of different fighter prototypes and you chose the one you think is best to continue development on. Uh, in that way you build your naval air force, you have to design carriers. And so I would say those are the main changes, the, the air component. Yeah, I want to say that the way you did the, the air request system is is wonderful. It really feels immersive, like we're just getting these bids from the military people, you know, Northrop Grumman or whatever it is. And uh, I guess it was just Grumman at that point. But and then, OK, how do the how do the aircraft? What are the statistics? Which ones do we want? This one has this benefit. This one has that benefit. It's really nicely done. Um, I have a question. What have you thought about ever uh, moving more? I think as we get beyond 1950 um, or even in the 1900, 1950 gameplay submarines right now, they're kind of abstracted. I would say the most abstract naval unit left in the game. Have you thought of ever trying to do something even like this system where you have this purchase system from various companies or something like that, or in some way adding more depth to submarines? Yes, I've thought about that. Uh, I don't think the same system would apply <clears throat> to submarines. I must say, by the way, that uh, large parts of the aircraft uh, acquiring acquirement system that was based on suggestions from our excellent playtesters. Uh, wow. So I should give them some credit. And many features in the game, by the way, are either uh, suggested by the playtesters or by uh, players of the game or fans that suggest things on the on the uh, forums. So I try to incorporate features that are are reasonable and good ideas from the players. So so there are many things in the game that are based on on player feedback and requests. So I should take the opportunity to thank everyone that has contributed with good ideas for the game. And it contributed to make the game better and make Rule the Waves 2 better than Rule the Waves 1. But uh, back to the submarines, yes, uh, I've thought about uh, fleshing that out as well, because as you say, it's the most abstracted part. Uh, but there is no time to do everything you want and you can't have everything in a game. It gets more and more complicated. I already discovered that with Rule the Waves 2, that the complexity uh, rose. Uh, immensely with adding aircraft and it took much longer time than I anticipated to develop Rule the Waves 2. Yeah, I, I want to also say that I, I don't think that it's necessary per se. <laughs> the game as it is, is there's already so many knobs you can turn and so much you can do with it. Uh, but I feel like it's a, it's a fair question to ask, you know, uh, maybe other people who are submarine enthusiasts might be curious about that. Piggybacking off that conversation, I wanted to ask, how many people had their hands on developing and contributing to this game? So how big was your development team overall, from playtesters to people designing the game to programming the game? Well, I, I'm the, doing the programming and the, most of the game concepts. Then we have William, who is doing a lot of the search and background stuff and installers and things like that and then we have about uh, five playtesters who contribute in in various ways both to documentation and with ideas and playtesting so it's not a big team now the other question that i wanted to ask you is you mentioned earlier that you came out with rule the waves one i believe in 2016 you mentioned did 
as soon as you released that game, did you kind of just say, all right, well, I just we just released this game. Let's get to work on Rule of the Waves 2. Or did you kind of like wait a little bit and kind of take feedback from uh, your from the fan base and then start developing Rule of the Waves 2? Yes, it was. <clears throat> it took about uh, a year before I started developing Rule of the Waves 2. <clears throat> it was uh, when we discovered that Rule of the Waves was such a hit and became popular was logical to continue development but it's not like i i sat down right away and also i i cannot develop all the time sometimes uh i get some sort of a what you say a coder's block <laughs> compared to yeah. writer's block uh, that i just feel sick of the whole thing and i don't want to see it more but after a month or two i I feel like doing things to it again, so I need to take a break sometimes. So I'm not. Lo I did not launch into Rule the Waves two right off after Rule the Waves. Was Rule the Waves two always in the cards? Like when you built it, sounds and please correct me if I'm making a, an incorrect assumption, but it sounds like when you built Steam and Iron, which is sort of the tactical battle resolution. Uh, I guess a little bit of background. Steam and Iron is a game that lets you play through uh, like World War I engagements in a tactical way uh, for ships. But there's no grand strategy, like you don't build your navy, you're using the historical ships, and you fight these battles out. Uh, Rule, the Waves two, Rule the Waves took that combat system, basically, and, and overlaid, as you said, a strategy element of being the fleet admiral. It sounds like that was always your plan to, to build that, capability was rule the waves two you know when you built rule the waves one were you always thinking hey we should take this through world war through world war two and with air combat or is that something that sort of developed with with the success of rule yeah it's the, it developed with the success of rule the waves i didn't think further than rule the waves uh, when i made it well okay I, we might begin too far off here sorry matt did you want to follow up on that no no i think that's fine i was just going to say i didn't want to interrupt we can go back no, I want to take us in completely another direction, actually. I wanted to ask, so Frederick, if you, um, let's say that, I mean, so you did Steam and Iron, you did this, the 1900s period, and you mentioned already that some people had covered um, the Age of Sail type stuff very well. But let's just pretend that you have infinite resources, in, infinite design time, whatever. What would be the game that you would most like to create or more, most like to see? What time frame would it be? How would you imagine it playing out? Oh, that was a hard question. Uh, I think I already did that with Rule the Waves. That was the game I most wanted to see. Uh, I want to see a game where you could design your own warships, and I, I've already done that. So, of course, I have lots of ideas for other games. I have several projects for various uh, games, both computer and board games, actually, that I have not had the time to, to go through with. So uh, I guess I, I will find something to do when, when uh, Rule the Waves is done, but I cannot say exactly what right now. Uh -huh. okay, I, good, I would you. like to make, when I think about it, I would like to make a board game, or I have made a board game that's fairly, fairly, it works fairly well about the Eastern Front in World War II, actually, on division level. Oh, really? Uh, Yes. Uh, yeah, feel free to I pitch won't... it. I mean, can you tell us a little about it? I don't know anything about it. <laughs> oh, it's it's not published or anything, but uh, it works fairly well. And I have playtested it with some friends uh, until 1943 a couple of times. I wanted to do a division level game about uh, the Eastern Front in World War II. And that one of that was actually playable. Uh, many East Front games are uh, monsters, and I wanted to do a playable game on division level. Uh, you know, not having all those artillery battalions or flak battalions or whatever that clutter up the map in, in many East Front games. I wanted a, a clean and playable game. Uh, also with some elements of role playing, uh, like for example, you cannot do exactly what you want. You have to sometimes do what uh, what Stalin wants or what, Hit what Hitler wants. Uh, so I have, a, you could tell, a, call it a working prototype, but I have never had the time to to develop that to a level where it could be published. It takes a lot of time to play test board games. One question that I had, since you mentioned board games, is there a possibility that you can actually 
port Rule the Waves to a board game. Is, is there any possibility of that? No, none whatsoever, I would say. The, the whole uh, ship design process is so complex, it could only be done on, in a computer game. What was the most challenging aspect of designing and developing this game? Oh, the most challenging aspect was the AI, the tactical AI. To make a good AI that could react to tactical developments to decide whether to, uh, to close the range or to open the range or to withdraw and when they should send in their destroyers for a, computer, for a torpedo attack. Uh, that was the most complex part, but, but that was uh, already finished in Rule the Waves 1. So I think the AI is fairly good. I, I get fairly good response on it. Of course, it has its weak points, especially al uh, around coastlines. Um, it, it's, uh, I managed to, to make it think reasonably well in, in open seas, but uh, with coastlines and islands and things, that makes it much more complicated. So it has some weakness in, in that aspect. Though I'm, I'm fairly satisfied with it. Uh, I, w I always hated cheating AIs. I don't like that. I want the, the AI to know what the player knows and analyze that information and act on it in the same way that the player would. Yeah, I think I, I would echo that. Um, it's not even something you think about enough, but probably that speaks to how great it is because, you know, a lot of small development projects are plagued by poor AI. It's such a it's such a difficult thing to create. And the fact that really nobody talks about the AI in World Waves, unless it's to praise it, is extremely high praise for a one-man development team. <laughs> um, although torpedoes, can they see torpedoes? Can you answer this question? Does the AI know that torpedoes are inbound? Uh, that is one of the most common questions on the forum. And, and uh, I get a bit peeved when people say that the AI cheats by knowing where, where torpedoes are. And it doesn't care about torpedoes. Or, or to be correct, the AI knows everything, but it doesn't make use of the information. Uh, so the AI does not consider torpedoes in the water. What the AI does, it, that is, it evaluates the position of enemy destroyers. And when they are in a good position to launch torpedoes, the AI will take evasive action or may take ev evasive action, I should say, because there is some randomness involved. I don't want to be the, it, the AI to be totally predictable and, and mechanic. Uh, so when your destroyers are in a good position to launch torpedoes, the AI may well take evasive action. And I think uh, players, uh, they, they experience that as if the AI actually knows when they launch torpedoes, but it doesn't. Well, that's good. I'm glad we put that issue to bed. I myself at one point had questioned that, so I apologize, and I'm glad that we have the truth is out there now. The, I, I, I do want to bounce off that because I do really like the AI. When I was playing the game, it literally kicked my ass left and right down the board. So <laughs> I did want to say thank you for that uh, AI because it, it is challenging, although I'm probably not a good commander <laughs> in terms of the naval aspect. But yeah, I just wanted to kind of, you know, put a shout out for that. I, yeah, I, I mean, a I, great commander I, in an Age of Sail game. I just charge headlong with my battleship and break through the enemy line, which is probably why I take so many torpedoes. Lord Nelson, <laughs> I also Basically, want to say thank that, you. I, I find I find my friendly AI frustrating. Then the enemy AI always sails circles around, uh, which I think is another interesting element of this game. Is that you know we mentioned the strategic layer, but when you do get into a battle, um, essentially depending on the difficulty level that you have your your ships set or your your game set to. Uh, you can either command everything, or you can be limited to commanding, you know, just what you you can see basically from your flag bridge, uh, or you know, even restricted further than that, is my understanding. So you don't necessarily control every ship in your navy, and you do have to rely on on captains of your other ships in many cases, uh, and and you give them sort of orders, right? Do you want them to screen? Do you want them to be part of your core force? Uh, but there is this element of a friendly AI that you have to manage as well, which I think kind of fits with, you know, some of the the themes that I'm hearing from you, Frederick, around uh, role playing. I know you you had mentioned that your board game, uh, you you looked for 
uh, some elements of role playing. And this game definitely has pretty strong elements in, in different places, be it you know the the national politics or even down into the actual ship combat. Yes, that is correct. Uh, that is something I wanted to bring out in the game uh, already in Steam and Iron, actually, that to use the formations that were used at the time for, for good reasons, because command and control was a big issue at that time with limited vision, limited radio communications, and then a lot of coal smoke obscuring the, the battlefield. So if you study battles like Jutland, you can see how little the commanders actually knew and how little they they saw. So I tried to to make the, the player, to put the player in the same position. So you have to use your light cruisers for scouting, you have to lose, use your destroyers for supporting your battle line or sending them in for torpedo attacks. But at the same time, I wanted to create recreate the, the limitations of command and control at the time. Uh, and I'm fairly happy with the, with the result. But I, I can see on the forum, some players are frustrated because they think their their sub commanders, their ship commanders, are stupid or doing the wrong things. But actually, that's I think that's rather mild with compared to what admirals have had to live with at the time, with parts of their fleet doing completely the wrong things. Yeah, I mean, I definitely I I, was, I didn't really think about it till now, but. Uh, I actually had a battle just the other day where my heavy cruisers basically just kind of sailed off and kind of were not doing what I wanted them to be doing as I was trying to bring the rest of the fleet in for a major engagement. And uh, I imagine I probably felt somewhat similar to, you know, Jellico with, with David Beatty just, you know, flamboyantly sailing off and uh, headlong into the enemy fleet with, without really maybe doing his job and, and kind of letting me know what's going on. Yes, exactly. And, and there are still debates going on on why this and that admiral did this and that at Jutland and what did he think and what did he know? And people are still debating that. There are uh, a, a myriad forum posts discussing those things even today. Yeah, I think the element of fog of war is, is handled pretty well in this game where sometimes, you know, you have a battle where you don't even find the enemy, the enemy fleet or you know, is your visibility changes based on the sea state or based on the time of day? I, I regularly get myself into scrap and then run and just pray that the sun sets so maybe I can escape. And it really does bring a lot of what you read in some of the history books to, to life in some of those situations. Yes, I'm fairly happy with, with the result. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that so many people appreciate the, the role playing aspect of the game because uh, that's one of the things I really wanted to bring out. To- Put people, put the player in the shoes of the of the admiral of the time, both tactically and strategically. So we've been talking about the AI combat, numerous things about Rule the Waves two, and even the original. Why do you think Rule the Waves is so successful? What key element kind of draws the, the fans to the game? I would guess it's the building element to to build your own navy over a long time to to have the the opportunity to nurture your uh, your navy to build your battleships to see them in action it's uh, like i said before to to have a connected whole not just battles but they are connected in a story uh, that will continue uh, all all along the game that i think that is what what is attractive about the game i would also say that uh, you know the budget management when as soon as you throw in finances to these kind of things and people get to i mean it's really cool you get to lick your lips like okay i can only afford this many ships i only have this much money do i build you know two battleships do i build three armored cruisers do i build you know five light cruisers some combination thereof so that there's a lot of deep strategy first of all the first tier is like this designing of your ships but then even like what uh, what do you do with the limited funds and then you also have the balancing act of tensions where higher tensions lead to usually the government supplying the Navy with a little bit more money. But then you also have the fear, oh, you might go to war. And if you aren't careful, if you're in one war and the tensions for another nation get too high, well, guess what? <laughs> they don't care that you're in a war. They're going to go to war with you too. So it's a very, the level of strategy is pretty deep. And that's, a, I think that's something that people find very interesting. 
I also think it captures the the time of the dreadnought race in the early 20th century when there was a, a sort of a race to war where everyone was building more and more uh, armaments, more and more battleships. And I, I think I brought that out in the game that there is a pressure from uh, parts of the establishment that we must build more battleships for our national prestige. And uh, it's sort of geared to that the tension will rise until eventually there there is a war. So. I think some one reviewer compared it to a, a doomsday machine, and and it actually I think it brings that out rather well how the politics and the the various mechanisms that contributed to World War One. Yeah, and I would I would also say to me to what you were talking about, uh, Eric Tortuga or whatever. However, we're referring to you. Hey, <laughs> you just call me Eric. We'll just um, normalize this. <laughs> <laughs> I to me what you were saying just now is. If, if I was to say, like, from a player's perspective, because I think everybody's looking for different things out of the games they play often, but I think if I was to say, like, what is one thing that really encapsulates what this game is about, at least outside of the tactical combat, and you could just say the one, one word is, is tra- or trade-offs, or, um, you know, how do you deal with limitations i guess limitations is another word right do you build a lot of smaller less effective battleships do you build a lot of heavy cruisers what type of war do you want you only have so much money to spend you only have uh you know so much you can push back on your government to try and get more funds and i think it's it's that interesting balance of trade-offs of of what do you do what's important and what's going to be effective how big do you want you could build potentially you could build a gigantic battleship that is going to be the best thing out there, but you might only be able to afford one or two of them, and it might hurt the rest of your fleet. So I think just that that constant pressure that you're getting from your government to build more and more ships, on the flip side, that constant pressure when you do get to a certain point, society starts pushing back saying, no, we don't think we should be spending so much money on the military. And then also that arms race element of, trying to make sure you have a fleet that can take on whoever it looks like you might end up going to war with. And then also the element of, you know, you only have, you have limited resources that, that you can assign and, you know, you might build the fleet you want, but when war comes, sometimes it's unexpected and you, you have to fight the war with the fleet you have, not necessarily the one you won. And war can sometimes come out of nowhere and ships take a long time to build. So you might have, a great fleet on the on the slipways, but that doesn't matter if you're at war with Russia and you've got 24 months left until your new class of battleships that all of your capital investments are tied up in, and and your current fleet's garbage. I I think that's one of you know this is definitely a game that I see a lot of players like to try and min max and find out what the perfect solution is. But I think one of the the things that helps push back against that is this fact that. It's easy when you start in 1900 to say, I'm going to wait on building too many battleships until dreadnoughts roll around. But the fact is, you're probably going to end up in war before dreadnoughts roll around. And if you don't do a good enough job of making sure the fleet you have now is in good shape, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Yes, and and that experience is different depending on what nation you play. Also, the, the solutions to the problem is very different for, uh, for example, Britain or, or the US, who have large economies and uh, have to have fleets that are capable of operating all over the world. You have to keep uh, cruisers in your, in your colonies. There, there is a, a requirement to keep a certain number of ships in your colonies on foreign stations, which is very different to, for example, Austria-Hungary, which has very limited coastal navy in the Adriatic that is basically at the start of the game, at least uh, it's uh, confined to the Mediterranean. Yeah, and I think, Matt, you hit, you hit something on the head, which is really very cool about this, uh, about this time period in general, about the way the game represents it especially, is this idea that you're designing a new ship, and uh, this happens to everyone, I'm sure. You lay it down, you commit your money, it's building, and Three months later, a year later, the technology comes, which makes this ship almost obsolete. <laughs> and this is this is the time period, you know, you, that you have to live with the fact that every ship you design is 
is imperfect. And I, I have a tendency to min max and things, something I don't like. It's my own cross to bear. But this game is nice because there's, there's no hope of it. Really, you can't, <laughs> you can't design the perfect ship. You can't wait one more month for that technology. You don't know when it's coming. Just like in real life, they didn't know when things were, would necessarily be coming around. They didn't know the effectiveness of various technology. Uh, so anyways, that, I think that's really exciting is that you can't wait. You can't just wait for a min-max plateau, hit it, design the perfect ship, and then coast for a while. You actually have to constantly be, be innovating because the ship you design in three years when it's finally done, it's already obsolete. It's a very different form. Often playing it, I feel like I'm doing the opposite of of Sid Meier's, you know, Civilization. One more turn. It's like, can I can I hold off on laying down this ship one more turn? Yeah. And generally, the answer, if I'm asking that, is no. I've already waited too long. But I know that the minute I lay that ship down, that that new gun that I want, that 15 inch gun, is going to roll around. And now I'm going to have a new ship that's all my resources are going to be tied up in for, you know, 24 months as it's built. And I'm going to see that 15 inch gun that I developed three months after I laid it down. And it's going to be staring at me right in the face <laughs> saying, you, you should have you should have waited. But yeah, you know that if I had waited, I would have ended up in a war horribly outclassed by you you know, know, opposition battleships. You know, Frederick won't admit it, but he probably has something in there that says if the player has committed a large uh, amount of money to a new design of ship, immediately give them the technology, which will make them upset. <laughs> <laughs> you might think but that's that... also kind of the cool thing that I think you often in games when you design your ships, you don't have the ability to kind of improve them. And there is an element of, of kind of keeping your fleet around longer in this game where you can rebuild ships that have already been commissioned. And you can upgrade them with new technologies that you've developed. There's obviously constraints on that. You're not going to turn a 12-inch gun battleship into a 16-inch gun, you know, Iowa or something like that. But there is this element of, hey, you might have developed new machinery that you can make your ship faster. Or you can, you know, modify your secondary armament. And this idea of, you know, these navies. And and sometimes it feels like it doesn't always make sense. But even though it is often expensive and takes a little bit of time. In my experience, the further you get, the more value there is in using the ships that you have in in hand. And that kind of explains why you see so many capital ships get rebuilt rather than, uh, you know, building brand new ones historically, because you've already invested so much time and, and resources into these ships. You're trying to maximize the life you get out of. In, the, in real history, that was uh, to a large part due to the Washington Naval Treaty that uh, limited the number of new ships that could be built. So many nations had to rebuild what they had to perhaps a larger extent than they would otherwise have done. But I, I agree, it's an interesting aspect of the game. But I think I, in Rule the Waves, I made that a little too easy or a little too cheap yeah. because people are doing it all the time they were rebuilding their 1900 armored cruisers uh, so they worked into the 1940s so i have made that slightly more expensive in rule the waves 2 and i've also with the the way armor is handled in rule yeah. the waves 2 this me in this also is less attractive because uh, in rule the waves 1 armor was simply made lighter for a given thickness of armor due to the advance of technology but in the rule the waves 2 armor uh, there's actually an armor value that will increase the quality of your armor over time and that means if you keep rebuilding older ships they will have uh, old armor that is not as effective as newer armor and so you also mentioned the hood shouldn't fight the bismarck yes yeah, something like that and you also touched on something, another like little detail about this game. And for those of you who have who are listening and have never played it, just we're going into these. You're hopefully getting a picture of how complex this game could be. There are naval treaties in this. Um, in World of Waves 1, there was uh, naval treaties. And that's been, I guess, a little bit expanded upon in World of Waves 2 in that you can start with a naval treaty in the 1920s start. Um, and this adds another layer of complexity where you can sometimes go to these disarmament conferences. Everyone who's building the, the ships, which are too big, these ships are all scrapped. And then you're confined, like just when you thought maybe you learned how to design a ship well, you're suddenly confined to like 10,000 ton ships for, uh, you know, the next 10 years or so with only maybe eight inch guns or something. And it completely forces you to 
redesign your navy, um, just how you were saying people were re rebuilding ships uh, for the Washington Naval Treaty, you end up finding yourself doing the same thing. Well, you know, I would never usually rebuild the engine on this uh, old ship. It, you know, normally it would have been scrapped, but I have no choice because I can't build another ship that has anywhere near the power of these guns. So although I think it's really expensive, I'll go ahead and replace the machinery on this on this ship in its next upgrade. That's really cool. Yes, I think that yeah, that will... works well. And as the player, you can influence the likelihood of a treaty by by your response to the event. So you can actually game the treaties to some extent if you want the treaty or if you don't want it. Yeah, yeah which is I a, learned a little that historical. the hard way a couple of times when I when I was first playing. Uh, this part of it was in Rule the Waves one as well, and I, I remember. I was struggling to build the fleet I wanted. I had a bunch of good ships laid down, but I was getting outpaced by my adversaries. So I got a random event that popped up that was basically like, hey, do you want to try and, you know, spend a little less on the military? Or do you want to try and, like, get other countries basically to lessen their armament? And it'll reduce tensions. And I was thinking, like, I'm not ready for a war yet. I've got all these ships laid down. Tensions are really high. Sure, I'll go with the lower tension. And so I take this event option. And then it tells me, you know, there's been a naval disarmament conference. All six of your battleships that you're building have been scrapped. And they were almost <laughs> all ready. And I was just like, what? No. And I, I remember it was one of those scenarios. Where you can imagine naval planners, uh, you know, in different, in different navies might not have been so thrilled with the Washington Naval Treaty. Certainly uh, shipyards weren't. But, but as a player, it was one of those scenarios where it's just like, oh, geez, you know, this is... Not exactly what I was hoping for, but it was a nice twist and kind of added an element to a game that you don't usually see games that involve uh, armament limitation. No, I guess that's not a common feature of war games now that you mention it. Is there any possibility that, and I know Historical Gamer is going to kind of jump on me for this, is there any possibility we can get this game to the mobile platform like the tablet or the smartphone? <laughs> <laughs> not just his story, not just Matt. <laughs> I also will jump on you. <laughs> no, I don't think there is any possibility. It's it's too complex. It's it's a typical uh, PC game, I would say. It's uh, partly for technical reasons, but also because the the ship design uh, process is so complex. Just imagine doing all that. Uh, fiddling around with armor thicknesses and uh, machinery and anti-aircraft guns to do that on on uh, on the screen of a mobile phone i don't think it's really i don't think it's really a good platform for that i would also say that it's probably not the kind of game that appeals to mobile gamers in general i mean this is i would it's more of a grognard type game it's very niche as it is and then you know to try to see if <laughs> test the waters in the mobile environment it may not be appropriate from like a sales standpoint either no i don't think it's it's also a game where you need to to concentrate a bit a bit i think it's not something you <clears throat> you play in your on your phone while commuting to work or something like that that's a dream though <laughs> <laughs> but yeah one thing i did notice when i was playing this game when I started initially downloading the game, I noticed the game was about 50 megabytes, this setup installation file. And it didn't take up pretty much only like maybe a, a droplet of storage space on my uh, SSD. And that's the one thing I did notice. What was it? Was it your atten intention to um, make the system requirements uh, in terms of storage as well as the graphical capability? Uh, less demanding so that the game can be played on pretty much any laptop and any desktop, no matter how old it is? It wasn't a design decision. It wasn't an intention. It's more a, a, an effect of the, the Rule the Waves builds on Steam and Iron, which is now uh, more than 10 years old. So it's, it uses technology that is a bit oldish, and also it has uh, the graphics are rather uh, limited, and what takes space in in game installations, it's graphics and sound, pictures and sound. And since those are rather limited, that is the reason for the the limited size of the installation. So it wasn't a, a conscious decision. 
it just happened that way. But then I noticed that players appreciate that it is uh, possible to play it on on a, a rather low end laptop. Yeah, I, I I did notice that, and I'm sure there's tons of players that really love that because no matter what computer you have listening to this podcast on whatever laptop you're using, whatever desktop you're using, you can play this game. So yeah, I, I thought that was pretty cool. So I guess the kind of jumping off off of that, the one other cool thing that I uh, wanted to kind of uh, jump into is future. Um, you have Ruled Waves 2 and you kind of like hinted that there might be future expansions that you might uh, expand beyond 1950. Is there any possibility that you might jump into other arenas? Like, I know you're doing Rule of Waves as naval warfare. Is there any possibility of a land warfare? I know you talked about a board game in regarding land warfare, but a computer sim- uh, strategy game uh, with land warfare? Possibly. I have some ideas, but nothing that is very concrete. I expect I will be uh, busy with upgrades for uh, Rule of Waves 2 for uh, at least a year to come. I, I really want to to uh, do a good product for the fans. And that's actually been one of the, the pressures for Rule the Waves too, because Rule the Waves was so popular and there was a much higher level of expectations for Rule the Waves too. And uh, I don't want to disappoint the fans. So I, I will continue to upgrade the game for at least a, a year coming with improvement on bug fixes or various good suggestions that from the players. But after that, I might start to think on something completely new, but I don't know what that would be at this point. You want to try a design game. I personally think an aircraft design game could be pretty interesting. Yes, that might be something. But it would be hard to put in, in the context in the same way as, as Rule the Waves. You have to put it into some kind of context with politics and war and things. You mentioned updates. Uh, are all those updates going to be free? Because I know a lot of companies are now into the DLC kind of format where you come out with the original game and then you get a f- couple of free updates. And then if you want the big updates, you would have to purchase DLCs. Are are you looking at a model like that or are you planning just pretty much do free updates? No, I'm thinking of, of free updates as long as they don't bring the game to a completely new level. But as long as it's small improvements or bug fixes, of course, it, it should be free. Uh, really, uh, I don't. I never did rule the waves to, to get rich. I, I did it as a work of love. That's awesome to hear. That's, that's what I love to hear from uh, all developers because um, passion is the driving force that I, I really love to see in this industry. This is a, I don't know if you're familiar with a program called Spring Sharp, but I mentioned I used to do some forum-based games, which were around sort of the early 1900s era. And one of them allowed you to design your own ships in a program called Spring Sharp, but obviously you yeah. couldn't resolve your combat at all. It was all based off like in a, a human being looking at your design and kind of thinking like, how would this perform? And, and this game kind of brought that to life and, and, and made that real. So it was... It was one of those things that kind of always it's special to me to be able to see like now you can actually figure out how your ship would perform. Thank you. I, I have used Spring Sharp myself. It's more advanced, I would say, than the ship design model in, in Rule the Waves in some ways. Yeah, you can get you can make ships that sink. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to be, you know, they don't float. <laughs> All right, I guess that closes out. That pretty much answers all the questions I have. You got, do you guys have any other further questions? I don't have any, okay. no. All right, I guess that kind of concludes our interview. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Frederick, for coming on the show. Uh, I really enjoy playing Rule the Waves too. I know Matt and Eric are huge fans. And if for our audience members listening, you could actually, I believe you can go to the NWS uh, website and you will link it in the description where you can kind of link to the website. I believe the game is $35 for and it's available on Windows 7, 8 and Windows 10 if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and they also have uh, if for owners of Rule the Waves, there's a, a discount so you don't pay the full price. So, Oh, that's great. Wow. That's, that's a really good incentive. Yeah, yeah, just throw it out there. 
Uh, well, thank you, Frederick, uh, for coming on the show. And uh, hopefully we can have you in the future when, you know, <laughs> more additions come to the game. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. Thank you uh, for coming on again, Frederick, Eric, John. It's uh, been a pleasure as always. And until next time, this is the Single Malt Strategy Podcast saying thanks for tuning in. And we're out.